Morning, Glory America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. Hugh Hewitt live inside the Beltway on this Monday morning. Good Monday to you. I hope you have a great week ahead. Um, terrorist attack in Israel. Two Israeli border police murdered. Uh, the Negev summit of four Arab countries in Israel, the first to be yielded multi-party summit to come out of our uh, having had the Abraham Accords under Donald Trump is underway, a moment of triumph marred by the terrible murder of two Israeli border police. Uh, fighting overnight in Ukraine continued. Some harrowing accounts. Anthony Blinken can't say enough times that the United States is not seeking regime change because uh, President Biden is back home, so now I will criticize him. I was on a special report on Friday night and was asked by Mike, who was sitting in for Brett, what do you think? And I said, uh, pablum, basically. I said, there's an old tradition. You just do not blast the president when he's in a war zone. Used to be he didn't blast him when he was abroad, but at that point he was near the Poland-Ukraine border, and I did not want to criticize the president. But, my gosh, what a disaster of a summit. What a disaster of a trip. Uh, we have Now, we've given Putin the high ground with the regime change, putin Moscow stuff, and, of course, they're exploiting it ruthlessly because they're Russian killers, and he's a killer. But none of that will matter because Will Smith smacked Chris Rock at the Oscars. Now, I had gone to bed. I mean, I watched a lot of TV for Hugh yesterday because I watched the uh, the whole Miami game against Kansas. And I don't know anyone's going to beat Coach Self and the, and the Jayhawks. But if anybody can, it'll be Coach K or, or NC. I mean, it's a, it's a stacked Final Four. Even Villanova hurt. He's still legit. So I watched that, then I watched the first half, and poor St. Peter shot like Butler. Uh, my friend Schrader was, was texting me that, boy, they look like my Butler uh, puppies, and I think they're puppies, right? Butler puppies. And they were awful, so then we just had dinner. Fetching Miss Sue and I had our son and his girlfriend over, and we were having dinner with them and didn't watch the Oscars. Never watched the Oscars. Who watched this, the Oscars? So here is the PG version. Uh, the backstory, everybody's there. Will Smith is nominated for and eventually wins Best Actor for his role in the, uh, what's the name of the, King Richard. It's the Williams sister story. King Richard is the father of the Williams sister. Good movie. So, but Chris Rock opens up with a joke alluding to Jada Pinkett's uh, hair, which is apparently not in the best condition and hasn't been for a couple of years. I saw them once in Hawaii. She's a gorgeous woman, so I don't I don't know why you ever make a personal appearance joke anyway. So bad on Chris Rock, but well, let's listen to it. Cut fifteen. <laughs> he is praying that Will Smith wins. Like, please, Lord, Jada, I love you. GI Jane too. Can't wait to see it. All right. <laughs> That was a nice one. Okay. I'm out here. Uh-oh. Richard. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. Will Smith. Will Smith charges the stage, slaps Chris Rock, utters a profanity, which I edited out because it's $100,000 for every affiliate if I play it, uh, the F-bomb. And which is you can watch live if you want. You ain't going to hear it here. And then later he wins the Oscars and says this wins the Oscar for best actor in a, in a motion picture. Cut 16. Um, I want to apologize to the Academy. I want to apologize to my all my fellow nominees. Um, This is a beautiful moment, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not crying for winning a, an award. It's not, it's not about winning an award for me. It's about being able to shine light on all of the people, Tim and, and Trevor and Zach and Sanaya and Demi and Anjanu and the entire cast and crew of King Richard and Venus and Serena, the, the entire Williams family. Um,
Art imitates life. I look like the crazy father, just like they said. <laughs> I look like crazy father, just like they said about Richard Williams. Um, but love will make you do crazy things. Oh uh, yeah, the love will make you do crazy things. You don't hit people on national television. Uh, and so Will Smith. I don't know. Look, I've got real stories. I don't have Hollywood drama, and I'm just gonna. It, it's a a sign of the times, right? Somebody insults her wife. Um, you might have used your acceptance speech to berate him and speak about the need to not attack women for their appearance, not to attack men for their appearance. But no, he went up on stage and hit him. Really, something else. Anthony Blinken, quote, U.S. not seeking Russian regime change. I think I'm obliged to say that on the quarter hour. We're all obliged in every broadcast that's a news broadcast to say the president doesn't mean what he says. Uh, because Joe Biden is infirm. You know it. I know it. Everybody knows it. Um, here's the uh, here's the worst one. Um, what's the worst one? It's the uh, Dwayne. Help me out here. Where's where does he almost get us into World War Three? Uh, how about uh, cut one? Cut, is it cut one? That's, uh, that was one of the big three. No, the big three is is about Putin. Uh, we we need to get rid of him. Which one is that? Okay, uh, that one is... This is regime seven. change number seven. Let's Ukraine listen to Ukraine will never be a victory for Russia. For free people refused to live in a world of hopelessness and darkness. We will have a different future, a brighter future, rooted in democracy and principle, hope and light, of decency and dignity, of freedom and possibilities. For God's sake, this man cannot remain in power. All right, so let's play that again so you know what only the last sentence matters to the Russian propaganda machine and to Putin. Let's play it again so you hear it. Focus on the last sentence. Ukraine will never be a victory for Russia. For free people refused to live in a world of hopelessness and darkness. We will have a different future, a brighter future, rooted in democracy and principle, hope and light, of decency and dignity, of freedom and possibilities. For God's sake, this man cannot remain power. All right, so that's actually a call for regime change. That's like what W said about Saddam, leave or we're coming. And Saddam didn't leave and we came. And so obviously it's the gaff of all gaffs. It is the, you can't beat that gaff. Uh, calling for regime change in the middle of a war in which we're trying to de-escalate and trying to keep Ukraine alive. And as soon as he said it, everybody knew it was a, it was just one of three major gaps. I, I wanted to string them together. Dash did not do that for me. Dash Patterson gave me eight cuts of Joe Biden because he loves Joe Biden. He gives me eight cuts of Joe Biden. What gaff number one is here? Cut number one. And you're going to see when you're there. Some of you have been there. You're going to see. You're going to see women, young people standing standing in the middle of the front of a damn tank, just saying, "I'm not leaving." I'm holding my ground. They're incredible. Gat number uh, eight is gaff number two. Um, sir, you've eight. made it very clear in this conflict that you do not want to see World War III. But is it possible that in expressing that so early that you were too quick to rule out direct military intervention in this war, could Putin have been emboldened knowing that you are not going to get involved directly in this conflict? No and no. I do not believe that. And to clarify on chemical weapons, could if chemical weapons were used in Ukraine, would that trigger a military response from NATO? It would, re it would trigger a response in kind, whether or not you're asking whether NATO would cross, but we'd make that decision at the time. And my final question. All right, so... Uh it would not trigger a response in kind. We're not calling for regime change, and there have been no American troops in Ukraine, nor are they going. That's just for the benefit of any Russians listening. You do not listen to the President of the United States because he's infirm, and everybody knows he's infirm, and he's gaff-prone, so his gaffes now are much worse than they used to be. Stay tuned. I'm Hugh Hewitt. It's Monday. There's stuff to talk about. It's Hugh Hewitt. Selena Zito is the commentator extraordinaire for the Washington Times, the New York Post, the Pittsburgh 
Post Gazette. They're everywhere you turn. Selena Zito is there, and everything, everything Selena Zito is found at selenazito.com. And I cannot wait till she writes about the Oscars. Selena, my friend, good morning to you. Good morning, sunshine. How are you? I am reeling because I go to bed. Yeah, I do all my show prep the night before. I get up an hour early and I start doing show prep again. And I see this story about Will Smith and Chris Rock. You know, I haven't been intending to talk about Joe Biden getting the world blown up by accident. And and I just got to. Did you watch the Oscars live? Are you the one of the three people who did? Like most of America, I did not. Okay, so <laughs> however, yes. go ahead. However, I did see what happened uh, because, like most of America, either someone calls or texts you or tells you, and or you look down at social media and you go, OMG, I can't believe that just happened. All right. Now, half the production staff at the Hugh Hewitt Show believes it was fake. Uh, and, you know, half of them believe as well that if, if you you know, throw a penny in the fountain and you'll return to Rome. So, you know, that's not saying anything. That's Dash Patterson. So what do you think? Was that legit or was it fake? Was it World Wrestling Federation or was it real? Well, like most of America, I initially thought it was fake. However, if you see the live cuts of what, that are not, you know, sort of dubbed out in the way that that um, the, the the Hollywood version of or they where they cut out the the scenes of what Will Smith was saying and and you know hearing the the the, the smack, you realize quite quickly it ain't fake. It ain't fake. That was some real so, stuff be, be, that happened before there. You, before you assess it, I want everyone to know there's a director in the booth and there's a producer who's talking to the director, and they have to decide what to do. And I don't know that right. anyone has ever known what to do except pan the crowd, pan the... Because, you know, if you want to tell the story, that's a great story. Everyone's going to be watching that forever. So my hat is off to the director and the producer. So what does it mean or does it have any significance? I mean, it's an actor and it's a movie and it's a bunch of Hollywood people who are worth too much money. What do you think, Selena? Well, I mean, I thought it was absolutely horrible. I thought Chris Rock handled it with grace. I didn't think the joke that he said, I mean, he's a comedian, uh, so first of all, and I didn't think the joke he said was terrible, uh, and it certainly wasn't worthy of what, what, what Smith did, and, and it's just sort of reflective, I think, of a, of a number of things. Uh, a, a lot of us are on edge. Of, we've had two years of hell because of COVID, however... You also just can't get away with that. You just, it's absolutely ridiculous that he got away with that. And then, by the way, to then win the Oscar and saying he's something of God, right? He's an example of, 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 of goodness. You can't say you're the example of goodness after you just cold cock someone. Yeah, it's a compli- it's a, it's cringeworthy. Uh the other cringeworthy thing that happened on Friday happened to my beloved Browns. Did you watch the Deshaun Watson press conference by chance? I I, I did not watch it. Um uh, oh my god, what happened? What did he do? <laughs> uh, no no, he said he was innocent. The cringeworthy oh. part was that no one else did. And, and so oh, yeah. offered repeated attempts the Browns declined to say that they believe him. They repeatedly said they trust in due process, and the meltdown in Cleveland is ongoing because many, many people who are the victims of sexual assault do not understand what the Browns did, even though he is innocent until a civil verdict comes in. He better not settle those lawsuits, Sully Nazito. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I mean, my problem with the NFL began long before <clears throat> Colin Kaepernick. My problem with the NFL was looking the other way when there were allegations of uh, abuse of women, of dogs, of, you know, whatever it was. And, and this is something that, that, that needs to be addressed. Because the best interpretation is that highly inappropriate, intimate things yes. happened that's the best that you know the the yeah. stuff you don't want to talk to your kids about right you don't want your kids to hear about what is Deshaun Watson accused of what's the best possible interpretation of 40 di- 40 different masseuses i mean th- th- 
I don't have to go into it. Doug LaMaurice, who's the best sports writer in America after Terry Pluto, won't discuss it because it's also cringe. But I, I just people need to, to go back to the basics of how to conduct themselves in public as a public person, Selena. Yeah, and, and you, you know, and, and big entities like the NFL should not be just sort of looking the other way because he's really talented. It's just wrong. It's absolutely well, you know, Big wrong. Ben had his incident and all the Steelers oh, yeah. fans. Uh, and, but that wasn't covered up or downplayed. And he was already Cleveland traded for this. I, I, I just yeah. can't even. <laughs> um, oh, so. Our, yeah. You get the last word, Selena. Our newsroom went crazy covering Ben. So we covered that a lot. Good for you. SelenaZito.com. Thank you for rolling with me. News of the morning. All, we, Selena and I are going to talk about completely something else. She, she has got a great column, but we talked about that because it's breaking news. As you always get, stay tuned for number two hour of more breaking news on the Hugh Hewitt Show. Hi, Canada. I love Mondays because I occasionally, very rarely, I get to ask Jake Sherman, editor-in-chief of the Punchbowl News. Go to punchbowlnews.com if you want your morning. Where's my Punchbowl News newsletter, Jake Sherman? You should you should have it any second. We had some technical difficulties this morning. We're working out, but we we I am uh, I'm savvy enough to have gotten it fixed. You know what I love about having you on a Monday morning is that I get to say that like once a year. I get to say, "Where's my punch bowl news?" and people know that I really do read it every morning. And I'm you know I want to know what's going on. Are there any Republican votes for Justice uh, Brown Jackson? I don't know. We kind of addressed this this morning. Um, I, I, my guess is yes. Uh, I don't feel terribly confident about it, but my guess is that Susan Collins still votes for her. Um, but again, I don't feel terribly confident about it. Uh, maybe Collins asks for another meeting. Maybe there's... I, I, I don't know the answer to that, Hugh. I, I still think Collins is the person to watch right now. I think that the chance for a bunch of votes is probably pretty slim. You know, originally I thought it would be 65 over under. And uh, I said so on this radio show many, many times. Yeah, After we, I I watched, we had a bet about that, Hugh. Yeah, I'm losing. Uh, I'm losing <laughs> because the hearings were bad. I went from, yeah, confirm her. She's qualified. And now I would not confirm her uh, because significantly under sentencing child porn possessors is not OK with me. Uh, I served 17 years on the Orange County Children and Family Commission, dealt with a lot of abused kids. Not OK with me. And I know she's very defendant oriented, but still not OK with me. Uh, ditto on the fentanyl brick, uh, heroin brick with fentanyl in it. But Jake, there, she's not going to lose any of the Democrats, right? So at worst, it's fifty-one fifty. Yeah, I, I don't think she'll lose any Democrats. I mean, Manchin obviously was the big, you know, the big question mark to the extent he was a question mark. I actually don't believe he was, but um, he is. Yeah, I think, I think, I think she's going to keep all the Democrats. I think she could get a Republican. Which, again, I, I, and I think I said this when we made the bet, it's in line with, um, with where they have been, uh, uh, where, where these Supreme Court votes have been over the last couple of years. So, but, again, you know, I, I just, my working theory, Hugh, is that there's always something that happens in these things. I mean, if it's not one thing, it's another. Um, Although this wasn't, always, no one dug into her background. This wasn't Kavanaugh. You know, my, I, I talked to my colleagues at the Washington Post, and I wrote a column about it, which is might be up at the, uh, you know, got 4,000 comments on Friday. and I, They may be reposting it today. I don't know. I haven't looked, but it's, it, it's a hot topic. I just think it was a miserable set of answers. And I don't know that she was very well prepared by the White House, do you? But, well, let me let me say this. The thing that the White House keeps pointing out is that there, and I don't. I'm, I'm not suggesting this is. I'm I'm just telling you what they're saying. I sure. think they what they say is that there are plenty. There's several Trump uh, appointed judges who have who have in almost identical circumstances sentenced people charged with the same crimes to the same kinds of sentences. So, okay, that would be uh, if they said that, Jake. I didn't get it. They're not doing a very good push out. And I'd like to know who, because I didn't actually sure, think it was could, possible you, to get it. Who gave a three-month right sentence for possession of child porn? That's the key. Who got a three-month jail time for child porn possession? So this is what they um, this is what they said. I'm gonna I'm gonna um, I could pull it up right now. Um, See, they're a horrible so, comms yeah. team. They're just horrible, Jake. They don't write anyone any. It was outside of the blue bubble. They do not talk to them. They are the worst comm teams in America. I, I, I've, 
I found it. Um, uh, they say, okay, so they say Amul, uh, Amul Thapar, who's obviously somebody who, who Mitch McConnell... Oh, wonderful judge. Deal. Yeah, wonderful judge. Uh, and... Um, here we go. Uh, I'm sorry. This is not a. This is not good radio. As I look. This no, up. it's great radio. But, Actually, people are on there. What did they, What did they say about a move the bar? People are leaning into the radio, Jake. This is what. Okay, so uh, in 2013, in United States versus Sherman, which is not me, the par sentence Green <laughs> Sherman to three to 360 months, uh, and the recommended sentence was 1,080 months. So that's one. That's okay. One stop. So Andrew, stop. So they started out with a 360-month sentence, right? So they say, mm-hmm. I'm old apart. Look, I wouldn't have an objection to a 360-month sentence for a first offender. That's three years. He did 90 days in jail, Jake. Mm-hmm. 90 days. I think, they're, I think they're trying to show the scale versus the recommended. The and that's recommended, not responsive. Uh, I told you they're the worst comms team in America. They're just, and they also point out they also point out two other examples which follow the same thing that you said. Andrew Brasher, who was uh, a ju- who was a judge in the Middle District of Alabama, confirmed to the Eleventh Circuit judge sentenced the sixty nine year old defendant for receipt and possession to eighty four months when the guidelines. Uh, were no, okay, to ninety days, three months. Next one. Yeah, so, no, I agree with you, Joseph <laughs> Bianco, uh, judge in the Eastern District of New York. Confirmed to the Second Circuit, uh, uh, sentenced somebody to sixty months when his guideline the guidelines were one fifty one to one five years. Five. So, yeah. Jake, do you get my point? Is that totally. ninety days? Totally. I just, as a father, as a grandfather, as a member of a child and family commission for seventeen years in Orange County, the Orange County Children and Family Commission, that you know we deal with trying to get kids through tough circumstances, and some of them have been abused. It's a I do not fathom giving the possessor of child porn three months. It's like a red line for me, but but they don't. And the fact that they tried to argue it that way, it goes to the, they didn't send that to me because they know that's terrible comms. Uh, that, that's just stupid. Who sent that to you? That is, I, I, I'm not going to say who sent it to me. Uh, it was actually written up, I believe, um, by uh, uh, Glenn Kessler at the Washington Post. So and Glenn thought um, that that was a fact check on. Oh, gosh, i got to go look at that, because I like Glenn's work most of the time, but occasionally he swings and he misses. That's a talking point. It's terrible. Jake, what did you make of the Oscars? What do you make of Deshaun Watson? What do you make of this all compared to the Ukraine and the president almost bringing World War III on it? I mean, there are some I, weekends where you just don't know where to begin. <laughs> no, I don't know where to begin. I was not awake for the Oscars. I fell asleep at... Uh, you and me both. At, uh, at about 9 o'clock or 9.30 or something like that, so I missed the... The slap that's heard around the world. Um, uh, so I don't really have any thoughts about that. Uh, a Deshaun question, Watson, question. It's not yes, a slap. He hit him. He did slap him, but he hit him. And I don't want yeah, people he, to think. You know, people are saying slap. That's an effort to, to not you or me, but people are using slap routinely. He hit the host. He did. He wasn't the host, but he was the, the, the presenter. Um uh, yeah, it was something. I mean, I don't know. He must have been really worked up about what he said about his his wife. I don't, you know. Listen, I, as I told, as I I told your uh, your very smart co- colleague Dash. The, uh, Dash. I They're not calling him I Dash, have... by the way. His new nickname is Dash Patterson. Okay, he asked so for I, that. We want call him Dash now. I please. will say this: I've got a lot bigger fish to fry in the world than. Um, than Will Smith and Chris Rock's beef over something that Chris Rock said. Uh, Deshaun Watson, I don't know. That's he said he has twenty two civil lawsuits against him. Twenty four allegations, forty different masseuses. He'd better not settle any of those. I mean, the Browns just risked the whole franchise on on a great player with a terrible uh, story behind him. Uh, it's just, and then Putin and the president. Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty clear what he was trying to say. I mean, like, I, I don't, I think it he, was. I think you can't, you think you can't overcomplicate these things, right? He said what he said, and then the White House didn't like what he said, so they walked it back. I don't, I don't think there's any ambiguity there, um, uh, and it was certainly the thing that everybody will remember about that trip. And, yeah, I, I was uh, on Fox News on Friday night, and uh, Mike was sitting in for Brett, and they asked me what did I think of the president's trip. I invoked the old rule, you know. When the president's in a war zone, you don't talk trash about him. And so I didn't, because he was on the Poland border. But he's home now. That was a disastrous trip, Jake. 
Yeah, I, I don't know. If, I, I don't know if I'd call it disastrous, but I mean, I, I think I'm a lot. I didn't watch the speech uh, because I was in route somewhere. I believe I traveled a lot last week. I was at the House Republican retreat in Florida. Oh, how'd that um, go? But Marjorie Taylor Greene really holding nice. court somewhere. No, I did not. I did see her in the lobby, but it was a nice. Uh, it was a nice uh, experience journalistically. Um, I, I, I uh, we got to talk to a lot of members. Ke- we, I interviewed Kevin McCarthy, Elise Stefanik. Uh, I did an event with McCarthy, uh, a fireside chat that was a, a Punchbowl News kind of sponsored event, which was good. That will be posting on the Daily Punch, our podcast this afternoon, oh. so you can check it out. A full fifteen or twenty. How minutes confident is Kevin of the majority? He says he's 100% confident. He says we're going to win the majority and it's going to be a larger than five seat margin. So he thinks so, he's going to at least win 10 seats. I guess that would make that, um, that would make that the number. Uh, he's very keen on reminding people 33 seats. If they win 33 seats, they have the biggest majority in a hundred years. I, I think he's going to do that. I could be wrong. I was wrong about the Supreme Court, but that is very interesting. When does that post, Jake? This afternoon. I will look for that at punchbowlnews.com. Jake Sherman, always at him. I'll go read it. And now I get to tell you it's delivered. Yay. Jake Sherman, always a pleasure. Follow him on Twitter at Jake Sherman. Get your Punchbowl News daily newsletter on what's going on inside the Capitol at punchbowlnews.com. Come back. I'll be right back. I'm Hugh Hewitt, Inside the Beltway Live. Good Monday morning to you live inside the Beltway. I'm joined by Ryan Kelly, K-E-L-L-E-Y. He's running for governor in Michigan. Now, Christine Whitmer is arguably the worst governor in America. And there are a lot of people running for governor in Michigan, and I will have them all on. But I'm starting with Mr. Kelly. Good morning, Ryan Kelly. Welcome to the Hugh Hewitt Show. Good morning, sir. Thanks for having me on here. Beautiful day in West Michigan. Well, you know, I went to uh, Michigan Law School, so I never actually saw a beautiful day in Michigan. But I am curious. Maybe the climate has changed sufficiently, but I'm from Ohio, so I had to say that. So, Ryan, uh, who are you and why are you running for governor? Great question. You know, you started off talking about Whitmer there being arguably the worst governor in America. I think a lot of people inside of Michigan and all around the country is going to agree with you absolutely. What we saw happen throughout 2020 with all the lockdowns and everything that happened, you know, here in Michigan with uh, with Whitmer's authoritarian rule, got a lot of people really eyes wide open of what's going on in our government and what happens when our constitutional republic is not upheld the way that it's supposed to be. You know, I've been very active throughout all of 2020 leading up into this year here, uh, being a voice of uh, freedom, hope, pushing back against all of these unconstitutional mandates, lockdowns and everything. Really, you know, Michigan is such a corrupt state and we see a lot of career politicians uh, multi-generational career politicians, not really looking out for the best interests of people, and just the, the, the deep-rooted corruption. And so I'm running for governor of Michigan. I got a uh, wife. We got six children now. Uh, we just had a baby over the weekend. Oh, congratulations, and, boy or girl. Thank you. It's a boy. It's our fourth boy. So we got two girls and we got four boys. Well, you got a basketball team and a, uh, a person off the bench. You know, at my... Uh... One of my producers had their first baby over the weekend, and, of course, first babies are always a big deal. But six babies, that's a big deal, too. How is Mrs. Kelly doing? She's doing fantastic. Everything went well, textbook. Everything is fantastic. It's great. Well, congratulations, and I hope everyone recovers and baby is home. Now, now Ryan, tell people what your background is. I know about Michigan not only because I went there for three years, but because Larry Arn, president of Hillsdale College, is my dear friend and a weekly guest on the show for the Hillsdale Dialogue. So I've heard about Michigan a lot. Uh, and Christine Whitmer is the world, uh, at least tied for worst governor in America. Do you, there are a lot of people running for governor, though. How do you get people to vote for you? Great question. You know, a couple things with that. I think 12 people, 13 people announced something like that, and we've dwindled down to about 11. Here in just a couple of weeks, you have to turn in your signatures. You have to have at least 15,000 valid signatures in order to be on the ballot. I think we're probably going to dwindle down from 11 to maybe five, maybe six people, maybe. Uh, my campaign, personally, we have over 21,000 signatures, so we've reached over that 15,000 mark, and, um, and so we're going to be on the ballot. But, you know, you bring up a good point, you know, some of the differences. Um, you know, a lot of these other candidates kind of come out of the woodwork. Um, you know, Whitmer's vulnerable. Hey, look at me, run for governor. You know, I have a track record of, you know, fighting for the people, with the people all throughout 2020, 
You know, I took a case to the DOJ and the FBI where Whitmer had violated the Constitution, violated federal law, and put COVID-19 positive patients in nursing homes and vetoed Senate Bill 956, which would have stopped that. And I looked at the FBI and DOJ and I said, hey, look, you guys going to investigate this? I mean, this calls for arrest right here. Um, you know, people can see by my actions that I walk the walk, not just talk the talk. Uh, i got a strong history of that. I've uh, been a CEO of a company. Uh, built uh, multiple different companies in Michigan. I was a union employee for 10 years, so I've had a job. I know what it's like to work for a living. I know what it's like to build companies. I understand government red tape. I understand we need less government regulation, lower taxes, free market economy, and we need to make some big changes in Michigan and do it quickly before this state gets flushed down the toilet like California or New York. Now, I um, I know that I think it will get down. I think you will make the ballot. That's why I'm only talking to people I think will make the ballot until they actually validate the signatures. But what will set you apart from the other conservatives who make the cut? Because I, I think it will be five or six people. It'll be like Ohio Senate race and Minnesota's governor's race and Arizona Senate and governor's race. I've, I've moderated four different debates already this year. There are a bunch of good candidates in every state. How are you going to stand apart from other good candidates? Great question. When... Uh... December 15 of 2021, I released my 100-day plan. So I was very specific on what, uh, what people can expect from me, number one, and wrote it down so that people can understand my stances uh, and where I'm going to be uh, operating as Michigan's next governor from. So uh, that's one of the biggest things that I was the first candidate to really put down a, a serious, well-thought-out plan. Uh, number two, you know, I go back to the actions, you know, uh, every other person that's running for governor here, they've kind of popped out of the woodwork uh, with a, hey, look at me, I'm running for governor now, is where, you know, I have a track record Michigan can look back on and say, hey, this guy's not just here uh, for a position, he's here for the people. And I think that's a real big difference. I'm looking forward to going to the debate stage with these guys and having these discussions. Well, if you want me up there, we have a Detroit affiliate. I'll come up and moderate the debate. I don't take sides in primaries except in Missouri. Uh, in the Senate race, because I think Eric Greitens will lose the seat, and therefore I don't want Eric Greitens to be nominated. Um, so uh, any debate scheduled yet? We have one at tomorrow, actually. So it's in Grand Rapids at the Delta Plex on the 29th. We're going to have a, a gubernatorial, it's like a values debate, values forum. And then one in Marquette. There's another one that's coming up in Detroit. I think there's going to be multiple ones throughout the summer. Well, I hope our affiliate in Detroit hosts one, and I'll come up. When is the primary? August 2nd, 2022. Oh, so coming up what is here, wrong like, with the Republicans months. that they have late primaries? Why do we do that to ourselves? You know, early primaries means you get into the ring against Whitmer earlier, but we're going to wait till August? Gives you three months afterwards. I understand the point there. It's something that probably could be looked at differently. The nominating convention for Secretary of State and Attorney General happens on the 23rd of April. That gives them a little bit of little time to, to run there. But I think, uh, you know, I think we're still going to have plenty of time after the August primary to really be able to go after Whitmer. We have to go after her, yes, on the things that she's done. But look, she's got billions of dollars coming in from the federal government, taxpayer money that she's using, handing out all over the place to all these different organizations and departments. And people have short memories. So not only do we have to call her out for the things that she's done, we have to be able to provide true solutions for the state so that we can show a different direction under new leadership. Look, Whitmer weasels are way back in. Expect more lockdowns. Expect vaccine mandates. I mean, the list of things goes on. And, and we have to be able to communicate that effectively to the state with, with true solutions and not just talking points. So, Ryan Kelly, what's the website for your campaign? RyanDKelly.com, R-Y-A-N-D-K-E-L-L-E-Y.com, RyanDKelly.com. So you're going to be up against a lot of, of uh, blue money. It'll be a blue wave of money. How are you raising money? How's it going? It's going well. We have uh, some great donors in the state of Michigan here. Uh, we've got some money coming in from out of state and a few other places. Uh, things are looking well. Look, in 2006, Dick DeVos outraised Jennifer Granholm by $30 million, and Dick DeVos lost by 14%. So money is only one component of this whole situation here. Uh, Whitmer has billions of taxpayer money that, as I mentioned, she's able to funnel all over the state. Those are basically campaign funds for her. 
Uh, so those are, that's the blue money you're talking about. Whitmer raises money in California and New York uh, regularly. So, yeah, there's going to be a huge wall of money that we're up against for this. And, um, and so we're doing well with our campaign, and we're going to continue to raise money and continue to provide a strong message that people are going to be enthusiastic to get behind. Ryan Kelly, thank you. Come back. If you need a host, a debate moderator, give me a call. I try and play these things fair and square down the middle, and uh, I'd love to go back to Michigan. Ryan D. Kelly, and it's K-E-L-L-E-Y dot com. Thank you. The first of the Michigan gubernatorial candidates. I think Whitmer's going down if the Republicans uh, nominate their best candidate. I don't know who it is. I'm not a Michigan voter. I don't know much about the race other than it's got five viable candidates, I'm told by my insiders. Ryan Kelly is the first of them. Great to have you on, Ryan, when we come back. Welcome back, America. Markets are rising in Europe, and I think Wall Street's going to have a good day because Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister and stooge of Putin, said, good place to have peace talks would be Belgrade. Josh Kroshauer joins me from the National Journal. Hotline Josh on Twitter. Josh, tell me, what do you make of Lavrov's comment? Do you think there's some hope here of, of common sense taking over the Kremlin? This is a nightmare uh, and we got to get out? Yeah, I, look, I think we've all been pleasantly surprised by the Ukrainian performance on the battlefield, holding the Russians to, at, at, at best, a, a stalemate. So, I mean, I think the, 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 the facts on the ground have dictated the Russian position. Um, but I would not trust anything that comes out of Sergei Lavrov's mouth. I, you know, I, I, I'll believe it when I see it, if there's any, any real diplomatic progress. I, you know, we may be getting to that point in the long haul, but uh, Rush, Russian words mean a lot less than, than Russian actions. And I haven't seen a whole lot of, you know, there's just bombing in Lviv over, over the weekend during or before uh, President Biden's address in Warsaw. Um, does, doesn't seem to be the actions of, of a military that's looking to, to you know, I'm, I'm, a diplomatic agreement. I was on Fox News on Friday night, special report, and uh, Biden came up. Mike offered me the question, sit in for Brett. And I said, look, I'm not going to criticize the president. He's in a war zone. He's on the border with Poland. I mean, they could have hit the president of the United States with a missile. I, you just get one coordinate wrong and you hit the president of the United States. Russia is really acting as reckless as possible. I know uh, Joe Biden is not the world's greatest podium speaker, and he stepped in it again. But I, is, is there any, what percentage of Josh Kroshauer's mind is worried about this thing going beyond what it is already a nightmare um well as far as i mean look i i i'm worried all the time i mean I, you know i don't think we, aside, aside from, aside from some concerned folks at the white house that were warning about russia's intentions before the war um i don't think anyone thought russia was going to invade fully uh, ukraine um so uh, you know things can get worse but um i i think i've also been pleasantly surprised by the resilience of the nato alliance i i, I think President Biden's speech, aside from that uh, gap at the very end, uh, was, was actually a very strong speech. Uh, well, it's kind of like saying the Oscars went well, except for the Will Smith Chris Rock incident, isn't it? Well, you know, I, I thought it was a gap, but I also didn't think, I, I, I thought the intention behind his comment, uh, saying that Putin shouldn't be the leader of Russia, was, uh, I mean, I, actually, I think the bigger mistake was the walk back. I mean, the way they, the, 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 the White House walked it back and almost said the president didn't mean what he was saying. I, I, I thought. You know, that was in line with, you know, the Reagan's evil empire line and, and really oh, moral, it, moral language. It is close. You're, you're better to say the evil empire speech than the Berlin Wall speech, as some people compare. It, it was a fine speech given in the shadow of danger that, unfortunately, it's like uh, other, than, other than that, how is the show, Mrs. Lincoln? Because uh, when you've got Macron saying walking it back when you've got other heads of state walking it back and not just jen Psaki, then you've got kind of a meltdown well i mean like i said you I, I think the bigger issue was almost undermining the president i mean there, there's ways of spinning it there are ways of saying he didn't mean regime change but he doesn't believe putin should, has the moral standing to be the leader of russia that would have been the spin i would have i would have gone with i agree they, that they, would have been good they spin. Ended up just walking that thing back and, and, and undermine their own their own leader so tony yeah, but i agree that's, that's good spin that's why you're on special report uh, Josh and I did special report together. We haven't been together since my lowest rated TV show in history on MSNBC, so that was fun. Um, tell me, what is the over-under in your mind for Judge Brown Jackson becoming Justice Brown Jackson? Yeah, 98, 99%. Joe Manchin came out for in, in favor of her confirmation over, I guess it was Friday, and that pretty much does it. I agree. Uh, She's going to be confirmed, but is it going to be 51-50, or will she get a Republican vote? 
I, oh, I think Susan Collins definitely. Oh, I, I would bet on Susan Collins voting for her. I, I wouldn't be surprised if one or two others, Lisa Murkowski, Mitt Romney, end up voting to confirm. Uh, I, you know, look, I, I, I thought she did a very good job, but I also also thought, and I think we talked about this on Special Report, that the confirmation process exposed some serious weaknesses from the Democratic Party on the culture wars, on crime, on sentencing, that are going to come up, not in the context of, of, of the judge, but in terms of how Democrats react to some of these culture war issues. And she was, you know, that I wrote in my column today that she, she was caught frozen when she was just asked the basic question of what what is a woman? And these, yeah, these she, she, she saw the trap door opening in front of her and she froze. But mostly yeah. I'm concerned about a 90 day sentence for child porn possession. I didn't think that was actually possible, Josh. Yeah, I mean, look, that was a, that, I thought Holly uh, had, had, a, had a sort of a, a lawyer's Perry Mason moment where he was litigating that one case. I thought he had a, you know, that was a vulnerability of hers. But you know, by and large, I, I thought she she did well. I, I didn't I didn't think they made the case convincingly that there was a pattern uh, of low sentencing um, in, in in these types of cases. But I also think that those vulnerable. We know where Democrats stand on some of these law and order issues. We know. So I got a question stand. for you, very quick. Uh, you said culture war issues. That I think that's different from crime and and civil order issues. Do you do you? lump them all together because i think culture war issues are like abortion and yeah and other but but crime is different i think crime is its own category yeah I, I, so i do but i would i would say the one the, when the culture war merges with quality of life that is when it becomes very politically toxic and crime is one of those issues education crime that's when these are you know, somewhat cultural issues but they're also quality of life issues my kid getting a good education am i safe in my own community so that that's where the the rubber really meets, meets the road yeah, I agree. There's economic, there's quality of life, there's culture. And Josh has got it on the nose. Hotline Josh on Twitter. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Dash. Thank you, Harley. Thank you, Ben. Gentle Ben's got a baby. He'll be back in a week. We'll get the baby report. We're all very happy for him, and we're happy that you listen today. Come back tomorrow, but stop by the Help Ukraine button at the top of HughHewitt.com. Please be generous. They need every dollar, your best gift. It's a massive problem, and Food for the Poor is on it. God bless you all. Talk to you tomorrow on the next Hugh Hewitt Show.